the the intent of tonight may um, may seem a little redundant, but I think part of what our philosophy is in terms of creating these modules that are self-contained but are about the same topic coming from different angles is um, to understand and to reinforce that learning is an iterative process that um, you need to um, continue and you need to um, build upon throughout your training. And so the idea of looking at hydrocephalus or endoscopic treatment of hydrocephalus um, over and over for four weeks will hopefully um, give you the reinforced knowledge that when you go into the clinics and you're helping to set up a patient or doing an evaluation, you'll be able to draw upon that data bank of knowledge a lot more than if you had just heard a lecture once. Um, that's our philosophy. I, I think it, um, it bears fruit. That's how we train our residents. Um, and um, so even though some of the stuff you may have heard before, I think I'll try to pull in parts of the first three lectures um, that I can and um, give this sort of a capstone feel to the module. And of course, um, uh, this is not the end of your learning. Go out and read more primary articles, go look at videos. It's an opportunity for you to continue and figure out what you want to continue to learn in this field and then go forth and find your mentors and your faculty at your home institutions and um, look for projects to work on with them. Dr. DePatria has offered to answer questions during the seminar like I did during his. So if you have questions, obviously I can't see you or, or, or call on you even though I would love to. And so leave messages. And at the end of this seminar, if I have some time, I'll come back and, and see if there's any questions at the end. But um, hopefully um, this has been a fun experience and, and we'll get going. The first week was supposed to be my lecture on CSF dynamics. And um, because Dr. Swedan um, was away this week, we decided to switch our lectures around. So he gave my lecture and I'm giving his. The truth is, as colleagues, we have so many shared cases and videos, I don't even know whose videos are whose anymore. A lot of the videos are actually his. Um, you know, he trained me when I was a resident at Cornell and then now I'm his partner. And so um, hopefully you'll hear a lot of similarities in the, the philosophy and the nuances of how we do endoscopic surgery. Um, and um, without further ado, we'll get into it here. So the endoscopic treatment of hydrocephalus um, is um, sort of twofold. There is an endoscopic role for shunt placement that um, we personally don't believe in uh, too greatly at Cornell. Um, there are some facilities that still use endoscopic um, techniques to actually place the catheter in the optimal position. There have been some pretty convincing studies that this doesn't actually um, improve the life of the shunt or reduce shunt malfunctions. And so it does potentially add the risk of further manipulation, longer cases, chance for infection. Um, and so we don't use it there very much, but it's clearly the mainstay within intraventricular exploration for things like ETV, um, where doing primary CSF diversion um, is the goal without implantable hardware. Um, we use it for ETV, but also for other reestablishment of CSF flow surgeries, such as aqueductoplasty, that's actually ballooning open the aqueduct or putting a stent into the aqueduct, foraminoplasty, so there, there are um, situations, sometimes post-tumor resection for colloid cysts, sometimes post-infectious um, etiologies where the foramen of Monroe is scarred down. You can actually open up the foramen and, and um, restore flow without placing a shunt, um, doing um, fenestrations of the septum pellucidum, or doing fulguration or cauterization of the choroid plexus. So all these are indications where we use the endoscope, but clearly, you know, the, um, the main player is ETV. It's where a lot of us train and, and sort of get more comfortable using the equipment. Um, and that's where we're going to focus a little bit tonight. So here's the, the literature on endoscopic shunt insertion. I'll just say that there's no clear benefit um, from large randomized studies here. And so we don't personally use it very much. Um, you can use it for ventricular access devices, um, for tumor cysts, other etiologies. Again, those are small nuances that you'll, you'll see as you, you know, get through your training, but um, not anywhere near the frequency that you'll use it for straightforward endoscopic um, CSF diversions. This may be a, famil a familiar picture at this point for those of you who have been here throughout the entire um, seminar series. Um, understanding the CSF flow pathways that Dr. Swedan talked about in the first week are really the, um, the, really the basics of getting all the way to the point where you're doing endoscopic third ventriculostomy. The idea here, and then hopefully you can see 
my pointer. Ryan, can you guys see a pointer or maybe not? The, the ability to um, restore flow between the third ventricle, right, in the center of the, the, the ventricular system there, to the prepontine cistern in front of the brainstem is really the key to all of uh, the literature and the history of ETV. Um, you can also go through the lamina terminalis, which you can see right in front of the third ventricle there. Um, but uh, going through the floor of the third ventricle uh, into the prepontine cistern is really the key here, just getting you downstream of the obstructive etiology, which is typically at the aqueduct of Silvius, but not always, and we'll talk about that. Um, you know, as in all neurosurgery and all of medicine, you know, patient selection is really the key to good outcomes. You know, great technical surgeons are, um, are fantastic to watch and to learn from, but most good surgeons are good surgeons because they pick their patients well and choose their surgeries well. Um, and picking the etiology of a, a not communicating hydrocephalus, um, understanding the upstream cause of it, whether it's an obstruction here uh, at the aqueduct that you can see here at the distal aspect, probably from a scar or adhesion, maybe from an intraventricular hemorrhage as a neonate, or this, which is a classic uh, MRI scan of a tectoglioma, a, a low-grade benign tumor that enlarges the tectum to the point that it obstructs the aqueduct. A cyst in the, in the posterior third ventricle, maybe a pineal cyst, you can have enlarged pineal cysts, um, arachnoid cysts. Um, you can have uh, malignant pathology in the posterior third ventricle. All of them are doing the same thing, which is blocking the aqueduct of Silvius. And these are all fantastic uh, cases to, to pursue um, endoscopic third ventriculostomy on. Imaging, whether it's CT or MRI, I think, you know, in the modern day, we've pretty much um, gone to MRI scan as the go-to. I don't think anyone would really um, propose doing ETVs except in rare, rare situations with just CT scans, although you know, in situations where, you know, resources are limited and CTs may be all that we have, certainly, I mean, if you can do a 3D recon a reconstruction and really look at the fourth ventricle and the third ventricle and the aqueduct, uh, you probably could, uh, could do that. We do have fancy sequences now that we'll talk about a little bit later in the talk, including 2D phase contrast. Flare imaging can be used to look at the success of the stoma creation for ETV um, and then CISS imaging as well. Uh, we'll get to that. So let me get through those. Um, the selection of patients has been talked about quite a bit um, throughout this um, lecture series. And just to reemphasize it once more, the ETV selection score, um, that sort of predictive model of whether or not an ETV will be successful or not to be used for your own decision-making process and how to choose patients for ETV or to educate parents in the process of consenting to give them a sense as to whether or not it's likely that the ETV will, will succeed and whether or not a shunt will be necessary. Um, there are a bunch of scoring systems out there. This is the, the most um, widespread and the one that seems to have gained the most traction and it's quite simple to use based on age, etiology, and the presence or absence of a previous shunt. We do use um, imaging to some degree. Um, the patient history the imaging, the, um, the history of the previous shunt, those are all things that we certainly take into account, um, but um, all of those things have to be weighed um, when you're making the clinical decision. So to go through the ETV a little bit more, um, we had some really nice videos um, on week two about how to do shunts and how to do ETVs. Um, I'll try and reinforce some of those points here as well. Um, you know, looking at procedures, there's a, this is a paper from almost 20 years ago now that is still quoted sort of looking at the, the placement of ETV sites. Um, ultimately, it's a very personalized decision, um, utilizing the anatomy of that patient's brain, the size of their ventricles, the placement of the foramen. We'll go through some of that in the next slide here, but typically it's a little bit closer to the midline than, um, in a, than a shunt insertion site. Um, you know, if Coker's point is about three centimeters off the midline, that's the classic site for placing an ETV or a shunt. Um, and ETV is typically a little bit more medial, so you have a little bit less of the cross the ventricle um, angle access problem. Um, and somewhere um, just um, anterior to the coronal suture, although again, you'll see based on the MRI scan and um, the utilization of um, navigation, which has um, become so ubiquitous, at least in North American training centers, um, the ability to really tailor your entry site to get the trajectory optimized um, is key. Lots of, lots of um, studies 
that have probably overanalyzed this question um, too far. Um, but the key really is the customization of the entry point so that you have um, a safe entry into the ventricle, um, the minimal amount of torque on the um, fornix as possible, and then um, direct inline access to the um, prepontine cistern without um, creating too many um, obstructive um, lines of sight. So lining up the entry site, the foramen of Monroe, and the prepontine cistern is kind of the key here. And this picture really illustrates it beautifully. So you can get down to the floor of the third ventricle through a large um, lateral ventricle like this through a number of trajectory views. And so whether you're anterior to the coronal suture, just behind the coronal suture, you're not gonna have a problem accessing the lateral ventricle in a patient with ventricles this large. When you get through the foramen and you access the floor of the third ventricle, the idea of coming straight down parallel along the clivus um, is going to be absolutely key, particularly when we look at the videos in the later end of my talk, where there's a really narrow interval where you're trying your best to skirt along some of the vasculature um, in that prepontine cistern. Having adequate visualization and an optimal trajectory is really important. And so spending five minutes in the operating room at the beginning of the case, being really compulsive about looking with your trajectory and looking with your brain lab or stealth system to line up that trajectory is great. If you don't have the navigation system available or if you're doing a baby without navigation, still spend the time, think about your trajectory and just measure it out with a ruler using the nasion or the coronal suture and figure out exactly where you wanna go in to get that vertical access down into the prepontine cistern. If you sort of think about these things, even though as medical students, you're not gonna be doing this, the idea that you're aware of this anatomy and that you're thinking about these is gonna be really key when you're working with your, your faculty and your attendings to show them that you understand the principles of this. The fenestration site is obviously the whole key here, right? The, the, the beauty and the sort of the, the balance of ETV is that it could be the simplest, most elegant operation that we do. The anatomy can be spectacular, but there's also catastrophe just millimeters away. And that's sort of the whole balance of what makes neurosurgery fun in some senses. But um, there are, you know, replete reports of injuries to vasculature and ETVs, particularly early in surgeon's career, uh, in settings where these are not done frequently. So understanding the floor of the third ventricle is really key. The landmarks here can sometimes be crystal clear and they can sometimes be obscured, depending on the degree of hydrocephalus, the duration of time that hydrocephalus has been present, um, confounding features like intraventricular hemorrhage, previous surgeries, um, history of scarring from infection, all those can really distort the anatomy. Um, patients who have myelomeningocele or other abnormal anatomy as well can really distort um, to some degree. So getting into the third ventricle and pausing, looking at the anatomy. We always go through it because we're typically teaching the residents or medical students, but it's also a good time to pause, reevaluate, make sure everything makes sense because when you make that fenestration, that's sort of your one chance to, to make a big error. So. Um, the infundibular recess up in the front, right? So that sort of convergence of all those small capillaries that are going down into the stalk. Um, very, very clear, usually at the anterior aspect of the third ventricle. Sometimes you can see the optic chiasm right above you um, and the recess above that. The dorsum cellae is often very, very clear, um, especially in very thin translucent floors. You can see it, it's a bony structure that is the uh, posterior aspect of the cella tersica. Um, if the uh, floor is thin, you can see the basilar, basilar artery, you can see the PCA sometimes, and even laterally, sometimes you can see the third nerves. And then in the back, the first thing that you typically see when you come in through the foramen are the mammillary bodies, and that's really the orienting feature for you. So if you see the two mammillary bodies and they're not oriented in the right direction, that gives you an opportunity to adjust your scope, adjust your frame of view, um, and that really gets you going in the right orientation towards the anterior third ventricle. So understanding that anatomy is key and we still quiz the residents on it and it's on the board exams for the residents every year. This is the anatomical orientation. Um, again, you've seen this several times, but repetition is really key here. The choroid plexus will lead you into the frame and if for some reason you're um, not seeing the frame when you come in and your orientation is off, follow the choroid plexus, it will lead you right to the third ventricle. And typically the septal vein and the thalamostriate veins will converge right where the choroid plexus dives down and folds underneath into the roof of the third ventricle. Here you can see the anatomy really nicely because this is a large ventricle. The fornix um, is labeled F. 
the septum pellucidum is on the left, um, and then you're looking through the, the foramen of Monroe at the third ventricle, where you can actually make out most of the anatomy, even from here, from this view, you can see the mammillary body on the left very clearly. You can see the infundibular recess anteriorly. Um, the floor of the third here appears a little bit opaque. Here's a little bit of a zoomed in view. So this is not the clearest floor of the third ventricle. The dorsum cellae is gonna be white and bright and the basal artery is gonna be red. But you can see that sometimes it's not completely clear. The walls of the third ventricle, the hypothalamic uh, walls here are coming up at you vertically and you can see the mammillary bodies down at the bottom here. So everyone looks slightly different. These features will typically be the consistent uh, anatomic features that will guide you um, at this point in the surgery. Lots of different techniques here. Um, I'm a firm believer in blunt perforation. Um, the, I've seen tons of videos and there are some experts throughout the world that believe in thermocoagulation still. I see videos to this day where people are putting um, little, bo little bovie tips through the floor of the third ventricle. I've never found it necessary. And frankly, you know, it scares me a little bit, the idea of a perforator getting injured um, from heat. So whether you want to use it for a blunt perforation or for heat is important, but uh, blood perforation, nothing sharp, no scissors, um, no knives, nothing like that through the floor of the third ventricle. It's got to be a very, very blunt perforation. You'll see on every video, it's kind of like a little push and then a plop through. So gentle trend tension and then the floor will break through. Um, I, I use a three French embolectomy catheter. That seems to be the size that um, uh, works best. It fits through the um, scope really nicely and it dilates up to a beautiful dimension. And then you're going to see lots of mention of the membrane of Lilliquist. The importance of that in creating a, a, a patent HTV and then the exploration of the prepontine subarachnoid space. So we'll go through each of these. So here's the blunt perforation. <clears throat> here's a three French embolectomy catheter blown up. So it looks enormous through the endoscope, right? Three French is really quite tiny. And if you're doing one of these cases this year on a rotation, take it off the field before it's used, blow it up and take a look at how small it is. And that'll give you the size, the exact dimensions of what the stoma is in relation. Because sometimes under the endoscope, it's a little hard to tell. There's the membrane of Lilliquist through the floor of the third ventricle. So even if the floor of the third is completely perforated, if that membrane um, is partially or fully occluded, that ETV is not gonna function as well and it's likely that it's gonna occlude at some point um, and become um, a, um, a non-functioning ETV stoma. In the prepontine subarachnoid space, it's always nice to get a look down here, even if it's just a quick peek, the basilar artery is coming vertically at you, so sometimes you can barely see it. You can see the front of the brain stem there, P is for pons. Um, and then all those white fibers, those are actually the membranes of Lilliquist that are going from the brain stem across the clivus. And so these are stringy fibers are fine when it's an occlusive membrane, that's when the CSF flow is not gonna be adequate. So beautiful views here. Um, there's a rule against sort of voyeurism in you know, endoscopic surgery, not too much looking around, but you do wanna take a quick look through the soma and make sure that those membranes are, are fenestrated appropriately. So I'm gonna spend the next, I think, 15 or 20 minutes, we're gonna go through a bunch of videos here. This is a tumor biopsy ETV case. You can see the, the tumor at the bottom left at around seven o'clock. We're gonna focus now orienting ourselves vertically. This is actually an interesting case because you can see stippling along the floor of the third ventricle there, which is actually a disseminated disease. The, um, the sort of cherry red spot in the front here, right? That's where the, um, the infundibulum is. And um, here are the mammillary bodies. So even though there's anatomic distortion here, um, you can tell that you're off by um, a good you know, 60 or 70 degrees here and you need to rotate your scope. So getting the orientation correct um, is the first thing that you do and finding those anatomic landmarks is gonna be key to having successful surgery. So here's a more you know, appropriate vertical orientation, nice anatomy, there's the fornix. I'm gonna angle the scope down and come down into the third ventricle. There's your mammillary bodies, right? So, you can identify those every time. You're gonna get yourself on midline. Here, the floor of the third ventricle is a, a bit clearer, so you can actually see um, the vascular complex. You can, you can see what's probably the basilar artery and the PCA is going out laterally. The clivus, which is right where the um, device is angled right now, and the infidibulum at 12 o'clock. Pushing right up against the interval, right along the clivus there, gives you a safety margin. What I like to do typically is, is sort of find the dorsum cellae and just sort of ride down it, particularly in, in cases where there's a very, very narrow interval between the bone 
and the basilar artery. As long as you start on the clivus, these are techniques that you'll see, and you'll see lots of variations on a theme here. You can almost slide off of the dorsum cellae and into that prepontine um, space there by pushing down on the, on, the, on the floor of the third ventricle. And you don't have to worry about you know, the risk of vascular injury. <clears throat> here the dilation of uh, the balloon. Lots of um, different techniques here. Uh, how aggressive you might be with dilation of the stoma um, is something that I've seen lots of variation on as well. Um, there are some cases where the floor is so patchless and redundant that you need to coagulate back the edges a little bit. Again, I'm a little bit hesitant to do that too vigorously, although I've seen it done with great success and I think it can be a really useful technique. And there, the floor of the third ventricle is pulsating so nicely, you know that that stoma is going to be patent for a long time. There's no way that that's going to close off. Again, we inspect the fornix on the way out and ensure that there's been no damage from the endoscope. And so the whole procedure, you know, that, that baby may be in the operating room for two hours, but the actual endoscopic procedure is about a two minute surgery. So incredibly rewarding, great anatomy, and that's, a, that's sort of an optimal technique illustrated there. <clears throat> Here's another case coming in. So choroid plexus, a little bit more distorted anatomy here, but an incredibly thin floor. So here you can see the vascular complex absolutely beautifully. You can see the infundibular recess. You can see the optic chiasm up above. So this is a case where you have a beautiful interview, in, interval between the dorsum and, and the arterial system. So no concern right there about anything vascular um, occurring. You can be very bold, you can be aggressive here, you can dilate up as much as you want with the stoma. Um, the balloon is not gonna create any vascular injury at this point. It's gonna push those large vessels away. Um, uh, I don't have any personal experience with this, thankfully, but I think most reports of vascular injury really are during the perforation um, due to lack of visualization. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna mention this at the end, there's absolutely no um, problem with aborting an ETV if you don't feel like it's safe to do it. Hopefully, you know, that won't occur too often in your career, but it, it has been, it's something that I've done and I've um, felt completely uncomfortable without being able to recognize any of the anatomy, I, even after doing hundreds of these and um, decided that it wasn't safe and we withdrew and, and proceeded to a shunt. And absolutely no problem with doing that and keeping the patient safe, which is always the ultimate goal. So that was a really simple, straightforward interval. You can see the anatomy perfectly there. And again, coming through backwards, inspecting the fornix and then inspecting the cortical surface as you come out would be typical. I've already mentioned the membranes of Lilliquist um, a couple of times. You can see it just beautifully here. It's illustrated in that um, diagram on the left, but on the right, if you look at the floor of the third ventricle and, and connect up the, um, the dorsum cellae um, and the mammillary bodies, you can see not only can, is the floor of the third ventricle visible on this really um, beautiful sagittal T2, this is a, a quite thin cut, um, you can actually see the membrane of Lilliquist right underneath it there. And so this is basically running in the same plane as the third ventricle between the dorsum cellae um, and, the, and the brain. Um, and, if, and if that membrane is not fenestrated, then your ETV is not successful. Here's a situation, I'm just gonna back up a little bit here. This always starts a little bit too quickly for me. So if you look at this floor of the third ventricle, in anatomy here, it's not quite as clear, right? So you can definitely see the, the mammillary bodies. And if you've studied the MRI scan, you'll know where the basilar artery is situated, but the floor is quite a bit more opaque here. Um, and so not quite the same level of comfort putting um, your blunt perforator through there. Luckily, you can see the dorsum cellae. And so the idea is stay up against the dorsum cellae create the fenestration. Here we're gonna open it a little bit more widely with the, the tips and then you can see some of the thick membranes. I'm just gonna sort of scroll through this here so you can see the difference between the floor of the third ventricle and the membrane of Lilliquist. I'm just pausing there. So that's not the floor anymore. The floor has been perforated, but a thick kind of sheet of membrane um, is, still, is still completely obstructing. So you need to go through not only the floor, but then also through those membranes. And they're also very amenable to balloon dilatation here with the three French embolectomy. So you can see it right there. There's a great paused view of the floor of the third and the membranes right underneath it. So as you go through there, as long as you can see that basilar artery, that worm sticking out right there at you, you know you're through. And so we might go ahead and, and fenestrate some more and create some more perforations so that that membrane is completely dissected. And you'll see here, this is a case where we went ahead and did actually use some sharp dissection because the anatomy was so clear 
would never do this through an opaque membrane or where we couldn't visualize both sides, but we just wanted to make sure that that membrane was opened up. So a little pair of scissors, just a quick little snip and the membrane of the liquid falls apart here. Having sharp scissors helps as well. There you go. And then now the stoma is probably twice as large and likelihood of failure here has been reduced dramatically by getting through that membrane and now really visualizing that pre punching interval. So that's a, a beautiful post-operative result there. <clears throat> Another example here, looking at the um, Liliquist membrane. Again, really straightforward anatomy here. Third ventricle is a little bit narrower than previous cases. You can see the walls are a little bit closer, but the mammillary bodies and the um, basilar artery still direct you where you are. A little bit of a larger interval between the infundibular recess and the mammillary bodies here. So again, using your anatomy and seeing how opaque it is, going in an adequate distance away from the basilar artery apex, penetrating through, and then making sure you're not only going through the floor of the third ventricle, but also through the membranes. And again, I'll speed up here a little bit, so not to be too redundant. You can see really nicely there that membrane completely separate from the rest of the floor of the third ventricle. Here it's a little bit deeper, but just as important to get through it. Even if it's you know, a few millimeters deeper than you'd expect, if you don't get through it there, it's not gonna be a successful operation. And there you can see beautifully the vasculature in front of the brainstem there, completely distinct between the prepontine cistern uh, and the, the clivus, which is going in an orient oriented in a vertical orientation there. So no vasculature between the brainstem and the skull base. That's always the important thing that I think medical students uh, and residents get a little bit freaked out is that there should be nothing oriented in that direction. Um, and so that, that's what really makes the ETV possible, even in those situations where it seems as if the interval is quite small. Here's a video that uh, my partner put together with uh, two of our residents. I thought it'd be worth just going through it because it shows a little bit of the setup. This is so, sort of similar to what Dr. DePatry showed on week two in terms of some of the um, sort of real life views. So it's just a couple of minutes long. I'll, I'll, I'll narrate a little bit. There's some subtitles here, um, but I thought this would be nice to have in the presentation when it gets archived because I think it's, it goes through the thought process, the setup, um, and um, a little bit of the anatomical um, nuance as well. So here's a classic aqueductal stenosis case, right? So the fourth ventricle looks pretty normal, pretty massive triventricular hydra, really good case for an ETV. We put the kids on a padded headrest. Um, the incision is either right at the edge or just lateral to the edge of the anterior fontanelle. You can use the anterior fontanelle to gain access uh, to the lateral ventricle in, in infants uh, and babies who have uh, a patent fontanelles. We make a small vertical incision. Some people make a curvilinear incision. This is me videoing. That's Dr. Swade on the left and Dr. Morgenstern, who's now faculty at Mount Sinai there. He's our chief resident two years ago. Accessing the lateral ventricle, we go directly in with um, the camera and sheath. Some people use a peel away sheath. Um, for um, less than large ventricles, I'll usually put a ventricular catheter in first and then follow that track down with the endoscope. But again, there's lots of variations on the theme. And as long as you know your anatomy and feel comfortable with your technique, um, those variations are just fine. So here's a nice robust vasculature coming off of the um, basilar apex but certainly a clear um, interval there. That's the tuber scenarium. That's you know, the interval between the, the basilar and the dorsum cella, as you can see illustrated beautifully here. The PCOMs coming off the apex. Absolutely no question where the perforation would be made here. Again, we use the blunt perforating forceps from the endoscopic set. It's got a little bit of a rounded front. So even, we, even though we call it blunt, it does have a little bit of a rounded front to it. Making a tiny opening is all you need and then placing that three French embolectomy catheter in there. You can see on the inset there that there's a small um, tuberculin syringe, which is uh, filled with 0.25 cc's of water that we're just sort of inflating and insufflating and deflating to blow up and deflate the balloon that creates enough of a, an interval to um, create the stoma. Here, because the baby had pretty large ventricles and the, the floor was thin, a little bit of a patchless nature um, is recognized around the floor. And so that's, that's one of the risk factors for the ETV closing off. And so even though we don't do it frequently, doing a little bit of cautery around the edges of the stoma creates a little bit of a firmness to it and allows the, the balloon to have a little bit more tension against which to uh, dilate. And that creates a little bit more of a permanency to the, uh, the stoma. <clears throat> 
again, looking down through the stoma to find the basilar artery and make sure you're through the membranes of Lilliquist um, and then that the surgery is complete. There's a beautiful view of cranial nerve entering into the, into the dorsum there. Coming back out, inspecting the fornix to make sure there's no damage or bruising. And then again, inspecting the cortical mantle as you drive the scope through. Our post-operative assessment uh, typically involves an MRI scan. Um, you know, we can get beautiful imaging now on MRI to look at the pulsatility of CSF. These are sort of these live uh, CINE MRI scans. The truth is, is that the intraoperative assessment of success is probably the um, more important of the assessment tools than the post-operative MRI scan. Let's pause this for a second here. Um, you know, very rarely does a uh, post-operative MRI scan ever provide enough information to change a decision that you have not already made in the operating room as to whether or not a surgery is going to be successful. But it does provide at least a baseline against which future MRI scans might be compared. Um, and so there's a, a philosophical argument about whether or not it's worth it or not and how to follow patients with ETV, which um, certainly we can discuss in, in question and answer session. Um, but um, Typically, we'll get an ETV as a post-op scan. Its utility, I think, is maybe a little bit questioned, though. Um, here's some um, videos that I've completely stolen from uh, Dr. Swedan. He's published the literature and has explored the idea of these ETVs in patients with um, a very, very narrow or almost obliterated prepontine cistern. Um, there's a quote from his paper there, diminished or obliterated PPI is not a contraindication to ETV. Personally, I don't think this is where you really want to start your career, focusing on the hardest possible thing you can technically do with an endoscope. Um, but it does illustrate a couple of really important features that I thought were worth sharing. And so these are videos um, from, his, uh, from his papers uh, showing that even in uh, an MRI scan or patient where you don't think that there's any physical space on the MRI scan between the basilar artery, you can either go on the side or along the dorsum cellae and actually create that interval. And by the end of the case, I think you'll be convinced here that, that it's a fairly successful endeavor. So here's, oops, sorry, I'm just going to go back. Here's the video. I just, I'm sorry, it's a little small on the inside here. But their basilar artery is essentially right up against the dorsum cellae here. Just nothing more than a little nudge on the floor of the third right up against the dorsum cellae here. This takes a little courage to, to do this. Um, very, very gentle, just pushing. All of a sudden, you can see that a little daylight is created there. Nothing more than, you know, a little safety to know that you're in that space in front of the dorsum cellae. That little dark shadow there gives you that confidence. And once you've got that, placing the balloon in there is completely safe, again, because it's soft and malleable. And so even what looked like really going to be a difficult case now, you can see that's a beautiful stoma, and that's going to be a successful ETV. So um, not a contraindication. Not something for the faint of heart to start out, but the idea that this child was potentially spared a shunt for the rest of his life um, is something that's, that's important to recognize and is a powerful thing to, to watch. And here is another case. I'm going to put a little pause here as well, just so you can appreciate the anatomy here, right? So you can see um, the apex of the basilar artery right up against the dorsum cellae and the infundibular recess right there. So everything is really packed in nice and close. But off to the side, so an interval between the dorsum cellae and the vasculature is a little bit more um, defined. And so here you'll see again, find the dorsum, find the bone. That's a hard stop right there. We're feeling against the bone. And then we're just gently probing, gently pushing against the floor, and sliding off on the side there. If you go too far lateral, you've got the third nerve complex. Um, so you can't go too far, but as long as you can see that uh, basilar apex there, and you slide along the dorsum, again, I've shown this time and time again, that's going to be a safe interval there. You can see the membrane of Lilliquist blowing it up. And so again, a really, really small interval, but quite a successful result at the end here. Just let it play out for the last 15 seconds so you can see the, uh, the demonstration here. Nice and pulsatile, clearly through the membranes of the liquid. Definitely a small interval. I would say this patient probably has a higher chance of an occlusion from scarring than the previous one, but certainly that's going to be successful um, and something that can be followed over time. <laughs>
So the outcome assessment is, is obviously key to all of this. Um, you know, the intraoperative observations is something that um, we published together more than a decade ago. And I think the idea that you can assess very accurately whether or not a patient's ETV is going to be successful before the end of the case is something that I still believe in. And it has to do with the pulsatility of the floor of the third ventricle, the clarity of the subarachnoid spaces, uh, and the success of the stoma creation. Um, but there are a ton of uh, other tools that are available and the radiographic findings, as we've mentioned, um, are, are widely published and you know, people spend a lot of time looking at and debating the various um, radiographic findings as they relate to the success of an ETV. Um, ultimately, on the bottom, I think the, the key for any medical student who's quizzed about this would be to answer that the clinical signs and symptoms of raised intracranial pressure are the most important. So if a child comes in with signs of raised intracranial pressure, the resolution of those symptoms or the improvement is going to be more important than any single predictor um, on an MRI scan. And that includes the turgor of the uh, anterior fontanelle on a baby or dilation of scalp veins or you know, the positioning of the eyes. And so always go back to the clinical assessment, still more important. All of this you know, literature is great and it's important for us to study and to examine, but ultimately we'll come down to how you think the surgery went. Most surgeons can tell very, very accurately during surgery, I think it's gonna be successful. And then how the child is doing postoperatively. And if you take those two, sprinkle in some you know, factoids about the radiographic findings, I think you'll, you'll be in good stead. Again, let's not waste too much time going over all this MRI stuff. Take a look at some of the literature. Um, it's, in all of the, it's in all of the slides. You can go back and take a look at some of those papers if you happen to be really interested in ra the radiology of this. There's a ton of literature and people publish about it still to this date. Um, it's just a question of the utility when compared against the clinical assessment tools that you already know about. It's a really nice phase contrast, the pulsatility that you can see on the right, that beautiful burst of um, CSF coming through there, that's a, a disrupted, you know, proton spin signal there in the third ventricle, you know that there's a patent stoma there. But again, that's something you would know already from the time of surgery. Um, so not only do you have that sort of turbulent flow pattern at the stoma, you can also see changes in the shape of the third ventricle, gyration in the sulcal effacement on the brain itself. All these things are interesting phenomena that you can identify when you become familiar with looking at these pre and post operative scans. These phase contrast sort of cine MRI scans became really popular um, to the point that patients started asking for them and it sort of became a routine part of our analysis. I think there's a little bit of a technical limitation to this and I don't use them all that much. When they come out nice and you can use them for an assessment tool, they're great, but I think there's a little bit of a technical um, variability in, in how they're done, how they're assessed and how they're windowed. Um, so again, take these all with a grain of salt, but they're, they can be beautiful when they work, um, but the clinical assessment is always gonna be more important than any of these MRI scans. Um, you know, one of the things in the ETV success score and in our you know, intraoperative assessment tool was the presence or absence of a previous shunt. And I think we all understand um, in, intuitively that the presence of a shunt creates lots of problems with the potential for an ETV working, but it, it certainly um, should not be a contraindication to going ahead and proposing a shunt in the proper clinical scenario. So if you're seeing a patient on a, on a rotation and they have a shunt malfunction, but you look at the scan and you think they've got aqueductal stenosis and maybe the shunt was put in when they were too young or by someone who wasn't familiar with endoscopy, you know, the idea of bringing up, well, maybe this is an opportunity to try an ETV and make the patient's shunt independent is a completely legitimate thought process. And the idea of taking a patient who has a shunt and making them shunt free is something that's gonna add such a quality of life to that patient that it's often worth doing. Sometimes you'll find again, like we discussed, the presence of the shunt has somehow changed the absorptive capacity of the brain so that the ETV will never work, or the shunt was put in because of significant um, factors such as um, intraventricular hemorrhage or intraventricular infection, which is gonna make the ETV less likely to be successful. But even if, that, um, even if a percentage of those patients goes on to become shunt independent, it's worth it. Um, and I wanted to include, but forgot, didn't, didn't have the time to get it into my talk today, a really interesting um, analysis of the last 20 years at our own institution, just a single institution study, looking at the number of shunt revisions um, over the two decades. And you know, shunts used to be 
the primary um, reason why people didn't like going into pediatric neurosurgery and um, you know your shuntologists and half your cases are shunts and as we started introducing ETV and becoming more aggressive with the endoscopic tools that we have at our disposal the number of shunts in our institution went down and the number of endoscopic procedures went up and they just crossed about three years ago such that now shunts are no longer the you know, most common thing that we do at our institution because our population within the greater New York City area has now seen endoscopy for 20 years and has literally lowered the shunt volume in, you know, in, our, in our encatchment area. So it's something that you won't see in a year or two, but over a long time has been, has been really wonderful to see and to think about all the, all the shunt malfunctions and problems that have been averted in patients because of the introduction of this technology has been really exciting. So to bring together all the theoretical concepts that we learned earlier in the month and sort of bring them to bear on the reality of taking care of kids um, and what it means to have a shunt or to not have a shunt is maybe a good way to sort of think about wrapping up this, uh, this module. Um, re repeated ETVs is, you know, again, this is just a, a cool little nuance. Again, the residents made another video here. Um, there's absolutely no reason not to consider a repeat ETV if it worked really well the first time maybe the child was young or they had some questionable anatomy in terms of thickness of the floor or the membranes, doing a second ETV, again, at the, um, the possible advantage or um, upside of not having a shunt in that patient for the rest of their life and the rest of your career um, is really advantageous. So here, if I just pause it for a second, I'm sorry. You can see the ETV hole has been scarred over. Um, and as you, um, you know, go back down right through that same track there, you can refenestrate, reopen up that floor. And certainly we have many, many cases where re-ETV was successful after the initial uh, one failed. And again, a lot of that has to do with the age of the patient, patient selection, um, but the presence of an ETV failure should not be an automatic indication to go ahead and do a shunt. Some of it will depend on experience and comfort level, but certainly plenty of success stories to demonstrate that this is a successful uh, endeavor in a, in a select population of patients. So some nuances there, so the diminished pre interval, the repeat ETV, these are not necessarily the things that you'll start out with, but certainly things that you'll notice are um, part of the armamentarium as you, um, as you build your skill set and as you, you know, progress through your training and residency, you'll see these um, and have a, a sense of, you know, how far to push the endoscopic envelope um, based upon the experience of the operator and uh, the etiologies of the hydrocephalus. So always consider an ETV as an alternative at shunt malfunction, particularly at shunt infection because the shunt's coming out anyway. So taking out the shunt, considering an ETV, and then if it fails, you'll have to put the shunt back in anyway. You haven't really lost anything. Probably it's not gonna be a great idea if they've had meningitis or a bad hemorrhage. Doesn't, it's not a complete contraindication, but a relative. Um, you know, all the imaging things that we know about, that we've talked about all four weeks, looking at the aqueductal stenosis, understanding the anatomy. Um, as I mentioned before, consider aborting the ETV. If you get in there and you don't feel comfortable and doesn't look like the anatomy is right, you're scared about the vasculature um, uh, being um, a roadblock, way safer to place the shunt than to create a vascular injury or create a pseudoaneurysm. Um, so all these things are, are nuances that, you know, well beyond decision making at the point of a medical student, but you know when you're standing there in the room, and you're hearing these discussions. These are things that we're thinking about and deciding in real time. Whether or not you need external ventricular drainage as part of you know the decision to go from a shunt to an ETV is something again on a case by case basis. So always think of ETV for non communicating hydro, patient selection technique, surveillance required. These are not specific to endoscopy, but are really important for these cases where it's a technically challenging but rewarding case. The clinical scenario, um, the predisposing factors are equally important to the post-operative MRI scan. Following the patients and following the symptoms that they present with and they represent with is going to be far more important in some situations than following the MRI scan or those flow studies and trying to interpret what they mean. I think that that's um, you know um, a lot of sort of reinforcement and a lot of um, sort of re-examination of not only the basic hydrocephalus physiology that Dr. Swedan talked about, um, the wonderful introduction to shunting and ETVs from Dr. DePetri and the literature review last week, 
hopefully you've got a really good sense of how this field has evolved. It's a young field. Um, you know, endoscopic surgeries really started sort of its rebirth, you know, it was present in a really limited sense 100 years ago, but a rebirth in the 90s and then an explosion in the thousands. Um, but now it's really part of, you know, what all pediatric neurosurgeons consider part of their, you know, sort of their tool belt um, and a really important part of managing patients with uh, hydrocephalus. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.